Chief Justice Tani Cantillo Sakaue presiding. Please be seated. Good afternoon. I'm glad you could all be here, even under these different circumstances of 2020. This Koja hearing is, is historic in many ways, including the ways that we are appearing here today. And though we are socially distanced and though we are masked, um, this is a hearing that many of us have been looking forward to for a while. So welcome. This is the public meeting of the Commission on Judicial Appointments which has been noticed for this time and place for the purpose of considering the appointment by Governor Gavin Newsom of the Honorable Martin J. Jenkins to the Office of Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of California. As the Chief Justice of California, I serve as Chair of the Commission on Judicial Appointments. Our members of the Commission are Attorney General Javier Becerra and Presiding Justice J. Anthony Klein senior presiding justice of all of California's courts of appeal. We also have in the well, Amoy Kim and Charles Cahoon, who serve as staff to the commission. The letters received by the commission were made available to the press and the public a few days ago. The commission is in receipt of a letter from Governor Newsom appointing Justice Martin J. Jenkins to fill a vacancy created by the retirement of Associate Justice Ming W. Chin. The state constitution specifies that an appointment by the governor to the Supreme Court of California is effective when confirmed by the Commission on Judicial Appointments. Pursuant to a request by Governor Newsom, the Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation of the State Bar has undertaken an evaluation of the qualifications of Justice Jenkins Mr. Aminder Singh, thank you, the 2020 chair of that commission is present today. And later in these proceedings, he will publicly announce the results of that evaluation. Justice Jenkins has asked the following person to be called to testify on his behalf. I'll name the list now and then call each of you up separately to the podium. We have the Reverend Adrian Beasley, the Honorable William R. McGinnis, and the Honorable Felton E. Henderson. At this time, I ask, please, that Reverend Adrian Beasley approach the podium. As you wish. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon, members of the Commission of Judicial Appointments. It is my honor to testify before you on behalf of the appointment of Martin Jenkins to serve as an Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court. Now, when Marty asked me to come here to testify, aside from being honored, I was horrified. <laughs> the hardest thing here is not finding reasons for his confirmation, it's being able to tell them all in a few minutes. To be thorough, it would take all day. So, why should you confirm him? Everybody who knows him knows he's super qualified to make correct decisions. So let me show you the Martin Jenkins I know. You can witness Marty teaching young aspiring lawyers preparing for moot court competition, that the law is not meant just to be correct. It must be right. Check your facts, say, make them correct. Check your citations, are they correct? Check your arguments, are they correct? But when you check your conclusion, ask yourself if it's right. And if it's not right, start all over. One subject that's really important to Marty that has uh, been a topic of our conversations for a long time is integrity. Several years ago, when I was pastoring a Methodist church, 
I had invited Marty to speak for our Father's Day service. Well, he stood, removed his watch, and laid it on the pulpit. He told the congregation that he would tell them about three men whose integrity shaped his life. One of those men was his father, who had recently passed. And it was the first Father's Day he had had without him. He spoke so eloquently that there was not a dry eye in the room. His heartfelt description of the character of these men inspired every man present to come forward and share their stories of father figures in their lives. In less than an hour, Marty had done something I had not been able to do accomplish in my ministry. He opened the hearts of the men in my congregation. His authenticity, his integrity was a turning point in the life of the church. It's not hard to know why Governor Newsom chose to appoint Marty. After all, there's no one smarter, no one more competent, no more humble, and the list goes on. But the question for me today is why is Marty here? Why would a man who has spent his entire life in service, serving his parents, serving his county, serving his state, serving his country, then serving his state again, a man who's not interested in making more money or accumulating wealth, a private man who's not interested in notoriety, who's not looking for position or title or power, not wanting awards or accolades, a strong, healthy man who now in his 60s can finally get a life of his own do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and with whom he wants, before time takes its toll. Why is he here, ready to return to the grind of daily hard, unending work? And this is not a rhetorical question. So let me answer it with this one last story that I've never even shared with him. Many years ago, when I was accepted into seminary, the first orientation before classes started was titled Ministry as a Vocation. Oh, I was excited and expecting to hear impartations of biblical scholars and experience something akin to the raining down of the Holy Spirit. I was expecting to feel something warm and comforting that I didn't, wasn't feeling while I was practicing law. Well, it was anything but, and I panicked. I practically ran from the room, ready to quit before I had even started. And sitting on the steps with my head in my hands, I heard Marty's words that he's often spoken. He'd say, when we are called to service and an opportunity presents that allows us to give the gifts and graces we have received, we have to always say yes. Take the opportunities to give back everything because the gifts were just loans from God. They never belonged to you in the first place. Listen for your call then keep your eyes open for every opportunity to serve it. Then give what God has given you. Give it your all, and God will take care of the circumstances. And that's why he's here waiting for your confirmation. Once again, he is answering his call to service. When he starts releasing all these gifts he has on the high court, all of California and beyond will quake and he will serve with such grace and generosity that each of the justices will be glad he came. There's no doubt that the last years have eroded faith, 
of, me, of many Americans in the courts and the rule of law. Many are doubting if we are a nation of laws anymore or just politics. California's Supreme Court's influence has always reached beyond and been a guide to the nation. Now, more than ever, this court needs the best to fill its vacancy. Where are you looking at it? You're looking at a great judge and an even greater human being with only one motive for being here. That's to serve. And he will give and give all he has. I've watched the governor on television at least twice a week since the pandemic and the devastating fires. And he's had to make so many very difficult decisions. And I'll say this, among all of these decisions, one that will remain at the top of his best, as his best and follow him throughout his life is this one. He nominated, appointed, Martin Jenkins to the California Supreme Court. Now, I believe that the selection of the right person to the right place at the right time can reset the course of history onto its righteous path. So I'm looking forward to Marty's confirmation, his swearing in, and watching him roll up his sleeves and start making history with the California Supreme Court the greatest court in the nation. That's my testimony, and it's the God's honest truth. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you again, Reverend. Thank you. Please, I next invite to the podium the Honorable William R. McGinnis. Nice to see you, Bill. <laughs> Thanks, Jean. Good to see you as well. <clears throat> Chief, I would say to you and to Attorney General Becerra, Presiding Justice Klein, uh, it's a privilege and it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to speak on behalf of my friend and longtime colleague, Martin J. Jenkins. I would tell you that among the very first communications I received upon Governor Newsom's announcement of his nomination of Justice Jenkins to serve on the California Supreme Court was from my son who texted that I must have been very proud upon learning <coughs> of the governor's action. I thought for a moment about his use of the word proud, and then I told him in response that yes, I was proud. Proud, of course, of Martin's nomination to serve on the state's highest court, proud of all his accomplishments, proud of who he is as a person, and proud that he is my friend. I can assure you that I know Martin Jenkins. I first met him in 1979 when he applied for an attorney position at the Alameda County District Attorney's Office. Under the leadership of then District Attorney Delia Lowell Jensen, we had undertaken an outreach program designed to seek out law school talent and diversify the office. So we found Martin Jenkins, and he found us, and we hired him. As I told him in later years, I didn't remember much that was particularly noteworthy about his interview, but I'd seen a spark, a flicker, if you will, of potential. Apparently, I was right about that, as we have seen in a, how that potential not only was realized, but exploded, and ultimately has brought us to this courtroom today. But even then, it soon became apparent that he was diligent, honest, ethical, and ably balanced the need to be firm with the responsibility to be both fair and humane. And he developed into a very talented trial lawyer. In 1983, Martin Jenkins and I both left the Alameda County District Attorney's Office and followed different paths to the United States Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. He went to work as a lawyer in the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division while I worked in a different part of the department. We talked frequently about his cases and I followed his progress closely. He traveled all over the country and tried and won cases of police misconduct and hate crimes by white supremacist groups. So it was that he seamlessly moved from local prosecutions to cases of national import. 
Some years went by and we did not find ourselves working together again until 1992, when we were both serving on the Alameda County Superior Court. So once again, I have firsthand familiarity with his work. He had challenging assignments, among them supervisor of the criminal calendar and criminal departments, and service as the presiding justice of the juvenile division. In all these endeavors, he gained a reputation as a jurist who is extraordinarily bright, indefatigably hardworking, and who served with dignity and integrity. And so it was until 1997 when Martin, as you know, was appointed to the United States District Court, Northern District of California. Coincidentally, I about the same time was appointed to the California Court of Appeal, First Appellate District. For the next 11 years, we worked across street from each other, but it appeared unlikely that we would ever have the opportunity to work together again. In 2008, however, Judge Jenkins left his federal court judgeship and returned to the state courts by virtue of his appointment to the First District Court of Appeal. At the time, such a change in career direction from the federal court to the state court was considered by some, particularly by some federal judges of the Northern District, not Judge Henderson, of course, <laughs> to be not only unconventional, but controversial. Further, because of my long professional and personal history with Judge Jenkins, it was speculated that I may have played a role in conspiring to lure, if not steal, him from the federal bench. I deny that allegation. <laughs> it was never proven. And the fact that now Justice Jenkins was appointed to Division Three of the First District, where I, where I then served as the presiding justice, and was assigned to the chambers immediately next to mine are circumstantial at best. <laughs> Nor will I name my alleged co-conspirator conspirator in this base, baseless allegation because she is present in the courtroom today and may not wish to be publicly identified by me. So Justice Jenkins and I concluded our judicial careers together, or thought we had until recently, serving on the Division Three of the First District Court of Appeal. During his tenure there, he was extremely hardworking and productive. He often addressed complex issues, reasoned, reasoned through them thoughtfully, and wrote of them with great clarity. And he was unfailingly collegial. But his resume does not capture the full measure of the man. He is deeply involved in his church and in the life of his family. He knows people and is able to balance the formality of the law with the human face of justice. His community asks much of him, and I have never, never heard him say no. Whether it is working with African-American kids in an East Oakland middle school about the importance of education, or spending time advising the Youth Council at a church in West Oakland, or by hosting in his home for the last 29 years a meal with first-year minority law students and sharing some of his own experiences by way of empowering them or by speaking at graduations, or by counseling someone's child who is having trouble in school, or by being asked by a family to give the eulogy at the service for a loved one. In my view, he has asked these things by his community out of respect. Respect for his values, <clears throat> and for his humility, and for his empathy, and his honesty, and for what he has accomplished. And because they know he legitimately cares. They respect him in part, I think, for where he comes from and for his story. They see him and they see that part of his journey has been about, they see that part of his journey has been about acceptance and authenticity and living his truth about being African American and gay. Martin Jenkins knows and will not forget what it means to struggle and to be an outsider. So as I said at the beginning of my, my remarks, I know this nominee well, personally and professionally. I have worked with him as both a state and federal lawyer and as a state trial and appellate judge. By the way, he surely must be the most judici judicially experienced nominee in state history. As you know, he has been a municipal court judge, a superior court judge, an appellate court justice, and a federal district court judge. By way of full dis disclosure, I have found no record that he has ever served on the International Court of Justice in The Hague. 
but it can certainly be said without fear of contradiction that he knows courtrooms. He knows that they are special places. He knows what happens there. He knows firsthand about the lawyers and the witnesses, what impacts juries, the strategies, the tensions, and the truth. The jobs that Martin Jenkins held changed over the years and mostly got bigger, but he didn't ever fundamentally change. He has at his core always been the same person, decent and smart, humble and honest, fair and ethical. And he has always applied the law dispassionately and even handedly. In closing, Martin Jenkins did not seek out this job as Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court. As Judicial Appointment Secretary, he was vetting other candidates to, prevent to, the, to present to the governor. Governor Newsom, to his credit, recognized he had the best person for the position standing right in front of him and must have known that this nomination is an inspirational tonic, if you will, to all Californians in these challenging times. Distinguished members of the commission, it is my strong belief that virtually every facet of Martin Jenkins' professional career and personal history has uniquely and superbly prepared him for the appointment that is the cause of today's hearing. By every measure, he is truly one of the very best of us. And I commend him <clears throat> to you most highly and without reservation. It is my strong belief that in the years ahead, you'll be proud to have confirmed his nomination and will not recall ever having cast a better vote. I thank you for your consideration of my thoughts today. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Justice McGinnis. Thank you, Chief. Next, we invite the Honorable Felton E. Henderson to speak. This honorable commission. I must confess that uh, my presence here today makes me feel a bit older than I would like to feel because it was a generation ago, 1994 to be precise, that I appeared in this same room before a differently composed commission to speak on behalf of the confirmation of my law school classmate, Catherine Mickel Werdiger. Kay was extremely qualified to sit on this court, as you well know. She was number one in our law school class in an era when there were only two women in that class. And it seemed okay at that time for us to say things like, the number one man in the class is a woman. I was honored and delighted to sing her praises before this esteemed commission. And for 23 years of excellence on the court, certainly justified everything that I said about her that day. Today, I'm equally honored and I'm equally delighted to sing the praises of Martin Joseph Jenkins and to urge his confirmation as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of California. In a very real sense, it would be difficult for me to think of someone better prepared than Marty Jenkins to assume the awesome responsibilities of this court, and we've heard a bit about it from Mr. McGinnis. He has served with distinction on the municipal court of Alameda County, a court which, of course, no longer exists. He has served on the Superior Court of Alameda County, and again, with distinction. He has also served for 10 years on the Federal District Court as my colleague and as my friend and as my judicial next door neighbor and from personal experience as chief judge of that court during most of that period, I had an opportunity to look at his work 
and I had an opportunity to receive comments from the public and others about his performance. And I can assure you that he served with the greatest of distinction. His colleagues fondly referred to him, as did I, as the James Brown of the judiciary. <laughs> and for those of you who might not be familiar with that particular reference, the singer James Brown was known as worldwide as the hardest working man in showbiz. And Marty, we felt, if not the hardest working man in the judiciary, certainly the hardest working man on our court. He also served as a member of the California Court of Appeals before becoming appointment secretary for our governor. And it's well worth noting that only if he had served on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals could he have possibly brought more judicial experience to this job. And in this especially divisive days that we find ourselves in, it seems well worth noting that Marty's rise up the judicial ladder was propelled by both Democrats and Republicans in equal proportions. Marty is and always has been a man of purpose. Modest, though he has much to boast about. Quiet and introspective, but that still water runs very, very deep. Focused and determined and never ever forgetful of where he came from. Spiritual and kind and generous, especially to those in need. And it could be a whole story to tell of those he has helped over the years. He is a man of strong principle, firmly guided by the teachings of his church, which he regularly attends, and by the Jesuit training he received in both college and law school. And you begin to see these qualities almost immediately, and you realize you're in the presence of someone special, someone who has a mission in life, a mission beyond himself. I saw these qualities first about 35 years ago when I first met Marty. After he called my office and asked my secretary for an appointment to get advice about the career path that he should take. I think he chose me, we never discussed this, uh, because we both played football in college, he better than I, and he thought he might one day want to become a judge, as I had done. I don't usually take drop-ins like this, but Marty seemed special. We ended up talking for well over two hours, as my secretary repeatedly tried to help me out by sticking her head in the door every half hour and saying, don't forget your meeting down the hall, Judge. Now, of course, I had no meeting down the hall and neither needed nor wanted to be rescued. I could not be more flattered to have Marty refer to me as his mentor, as a mentor. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth not because I wouldn't be delighted to mentor him, but the truth is Marty does not need mentoring. He is always, if anything, overprepared. Marty's idea of being mentored by me is to ask if he can come next door and talk about a really difficult motion or problem that he's encountering. I said, of course, come on over comes in, he describes a situation which is usually indeed quite complex. He assures me he has really put a lot of time in this before bothering me. He poses the issue and then indicates his tentative solution. I say something like, that sounds right to me, Marty. He goes to the next step in the puzzle and says, I think I say, I think you've nailed it, Marty. Finally, 
he heaves a big sigh of relief and says something like, thank you so much, Felton. I don't know what I could do without you. <laughs> no one ever made mentoring easier than Marty. And no one will ever don the robes of this court with greater humility, with greater purpose, and greater commitment than Marty Martin Joseph Jenkins. I could not recommend him higher to this honorable commission. Thank you, Judge Henderson. The commission will now hear from the Judicial Nominees Evaluation Commission, and we invite Mr. Aminder Singh to share the results of that evaluation with us, Mr. Singh. Good afternoon, dear members of the commission. I am honored to speak on behalf of the Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation to summarize the basis of the Jenny Commission's rating of the Honorable Martin Jenkins to the Office of the Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court. The Jenny Commission conducted its evaluation of Justice Jenkins on November 6, 2020, finding him to be exceptionally well qualified for the service on the California Supreme Court. According to the Jenny Commission rules, the rating reflects the commission's determination that Justice Jenkins possesses qualities and attributes of remarkable or extraordinary superiority that enable him to perform the appellate judicial function with distinction. Justice Jenkins attended City College of San Francisco, earning an AA degree in 1973. Thereafter, he earned a scholarship to Santa Clara University, where he obtained a BA degree majoring in history in 1976. After a brief stint in the NFL with the Seattle Seahawks, Justice Jenkins was admitted to the University of San Francisco School of Law and received his JD degree in 1980. In his storied career, Justice Jenkins worked as a trial attorney for the Alameda County District Attorney's Office and the United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, as well as for Pacific Belt's legal department. Appointed to the Alameda County Superior Court in 1989, Justice Jenkins served until 1997 when he was appointed to the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. While on the federal bench, he served on the Non-Appropriated Fund Committee, the Discipline Oversight Committee, the CARES Public Outreach Committee, and the Ninth Circuit Article III Judges Education Committee. As a federal judge, Justice Jenkins provided, presided over many significant cases, including Dukes v. Walmart, a nationwide class action suit against Walmart stores alleging sexual discrimination under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. At that time, the case was the largest class action ever to be certified by an American court. From 2008 to 2019, Justice Jenkins served as an Associate Justice of the California Court of Appeal, First Appellate District. During his tenure, he also served three times as a Justice Pro Tem on the California Supreme Court. From February 2019 to the present, Justice Jenkins has worked as the Senior Judicial Appointment Secretary, where he advises Governor Gavin Newsom on all state court judicial appointments. Justice Jenkins' other public service contributions are extensive. He has served as a faculty member for the Center for Judicial Education and Research and for the National Institute for Trial Advocacy. He also serves on the boards of both Santa Clara University and the University of San Francisco. In addition, Justice Jenkins is a founding member of the Vincent Academy, a charter public school in West Oakland. 
Once every other month, he speaks to elementary, middle, and high school students in the Bay Area about the value of an education. Justice Jenkins' impressive 30-year record of professional accomplishment is equally matched by his strength of character, compassion, and integrity. He is praised brilliant intellect, first-class temperament, and boundless humanity. Justice Jenkins embodies the qualities sought in a Supreme Court candidate. Collegiality, writing ability, scholarship, and distinction in the legal profession, coupled with an unparalleled breadth of experience. Moreover, his compassion, humility, lifelong commitment to public service, and passion for justice make him a most deserving and worthy addition to the state's highest court. Accordingly, the Jenny Commission found Justice Jenkins to be exceptionally well qualified for the office to which he was nominated, Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court. I'll be happy to answer any questions, if there are any, and I thank you for the privilege of presenting this report on a truly exceptional human being. Well, I, I have a question. Um, did the commission, did the Jenny Commission um, express any concern about the fact that uh, uh, Justice uh, Jenkins, I still call him uh, a justice, um, moves around a lot? <laughs> Uh, I mean, are you confident that um, that he'll be uh, around? <laughs> it, it, it came up, um, and we think that it only adds to um, the experience that he'll bring to the Supreme Court. Well, I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Thank you. Singh, and thank you. express the commission's gratitude to the Jenny committee also. Thank you for your and their hard work. Thank you, Chief Justice. Now I ask Justice Jenkins to please come forward to present any statement that you might wish to make and to answer any questions that the members of the commission may wish to put to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief. Um, to uh, Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, uh, Attorney General Becerra, and, and of course, uh, a former colleague of mine, uh, Justice J. Anthony Klein. Um, I want to thank you all for convening this, this proceeding in such an expeditious time fashion. I know you're all very busy, uh, as was everyone else who played a role in this. And I just want to say thank you at the outset of these remarks. Um, and I want to share this with you. Just after I finished the call with uh, Governor Newsom, it was a Zoom call during which he indicated to me he wanted to nominate me uh, to this position, the vacancy to fill on the California Supreme Court. I had an extraordinary experience. I'd taken the call via Zoom in this building, in the governor's suite of offices on the 14th floor in the new part of the building, as some of us old timers like to refer to it. And when I got up and looked out the window to the Southwest, I was struck by what I saw, gazing over the rotunda of San Francisco City Hall. I saw the hospital where I was born, where my sister was born, where my brother was born, St. Joseph's Hospital nestled in Buena Vista Heights, just below Twin Peaks. And in that moment, I had a rare opportunity, not many people get, to see just how far I had come in that very moment, from that hospital to the nomination that brings me before you today. I had a flurry of feelings and thoughts, as you can imagine. I thought about the many sacrifices my parents, Merle and James Me Jenkins, made to allow me to be in this position today. I thought about the substantial sum 
that they paid for all their kids to attend St. Michael's Catholic School. It started at $9 a month and grew to the sum of $36 a month for two of us and then for my sister. And on a janitor's salary, that was a substantial sum. But they decided for their kids, they needed to secure us an educational foundation that would allow them and hold them on the journey that was to ensue, not necessarily to this destination, but to a place where they could use the skills that they had acquired to make life better for other people. I thought about my grandparents and my uncles, all 18 of my uncles and aunts strong, those who have passed away and those who are present, six remain living, the eldest of which is 96, the youngest of which is 82. Any concerns about my longevity should be put to rest. <laughs> I thought about the values my grandparents taught their children on the farm in Brookshire, Texas, about 60 miles outside of Houston, where they grew cotton and grew their own vegetables. The values that are referred to in David Brooks's The Road to Character's eulogy values, what are they? Hard work, honesty, integrity, compassion, respect for others, the importance of a moral compass for my parents' faith, and most importantly, giving what you have and sharing it with others. I thought about how happy they were. They've gone on. Proud because of this accomplishment, if you confirm me, but happy, overjoyed, that the values they held dear are the exact values that people have spoken of and about their children, that people get it, that these values far more important in many respects than people who have robust intellects and are untethered to any sense of values. From the moment my nomination was announced, I received a steady stream of congratulatory notes from kids I grew up in the, in the old neighborhood with, from the nuns who taught me in the sixth and seventh grade, from my coaches and teammates at Santa Clara, from the lawyers who opposed me in cases and that I worked with at the Department of Justice in the DA's office. Their notes speak about my values, along with my intelligence and experience, and why all of those considerations, factors, speak favorably to my ability to accommodate the work that I will undertake if I'm confirmed to this post. And I share all this with you not to tout myself. It is hard to sit here and listen to these wonderful things. But I share it with you so you understand how very blessed I have been over the expanse of my life to have people make deposits in me, to see in me what I didn't see in myself, to always be supportive, to correct me when I was going in the wrong direction. And if that doesn't humble you, I don't know what will. So I stand ready to answer any questions you may have for me. Well, you're looking at me, so I'll go first. Um, you know, I, we've shared mentors in Felton and Felton Henderson and, and Bill McGinnis. I've never dared to do anything that uh, I thought Bill McGinnis wanted me to do. Um, I share your pain. You no, know, he, he was a great administrator presiding justice. And Bill, um, my colleagues, uh, we all miss you. And when you took that mask off, uh, you seemed to me to look even more distinguished uh, than, you, than you did. Well. I, I don't really have a question, 
Um, but I do have something that I want to say. I have great hopes, um, and I think we're at a difficult time. Um, I want to bring up the man that you're going to replace, Ming Chin. There has never been, so far as I know, a uh, member of the Supreme Court who has worked so hard and so uh, eloquently about the independence of the judiciary. That's something that he began, I think, almost 20 years ago. Um, he was the head of the Commission on Impartial Courts that was concerned with the politicization of judicial elections happening elsewhere in the country, and we were fearful it would begin to happen here. It hasn't happened here, and I sometimes think we live in a dream world here in California. If you look around the country and see what's happening, and there has never been a time like today in which the rule of law has been challenged at the highest levels of our government. And I don't think that we can ignore this. I, and I don't know what we can do. I don't have an answer to this problem. And neither did Ming completely have an answer. The report of his commission, I think, is about 400 pages long if you count the appendices. Now, you're a man who's famous for reading everything. So I hope you do. I'm, I'm sure you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I commend that report um, because I think that you are the kind of person. Many judges are often very submissive. We don't like to uh, reach out and address issues that haven't been presented. But this issue is presented, and there has to be, uh, at the highest judicial level in this state, a voice, an articulate voice, uh, because I think that we're going to see uh, challenges to the independence of the, not just the trial courts at elections, uh, but the politicization of the appellate courts. And that's something that is new, at least in California. That's really all I, 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 as I said, I don't have a question for you. But I want to say, and I don't think I'm alone in this, uh, that you are an extremely eloquent man. You're an impressive person. Uh, and you have a voice. And I think we're approaching a time when that voice is going to be needed. I think you have another vote here, but you certainly have mine. Yes. Justice Jenkins, if I can first say um, thank you for all of your work that's brought you to this point. Um, it's good to see your family here. I, I suspect that uh, there are a few people prouder today than you are of this chance to, to be standing here on the verge of reaching the high court of the state of California. I think. Uh, Justice McGinnis said it very well. These are tumultuous times. And amen for California that somehow we know how to do it right. And uh, I, I, uh, I believe you're going to have a chance to prove our state right. And, I, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Because seeing your history, I had a chance when I was young to work with my father, who was a laborer, a road construction worker. And I got to see how much dignity there is in being a ditch digger when I had a chance as a teenager to actually work side by side with my dad as I try to help pay for my college. And there are probably no experiences that guide me better than the things I learned when I was digging ditches with my dad. And I suspect you learned a few things as well from having an opportunity to do some great things with a man who influenced, influenced your life. And so I have a question for you. The buck will now stop with you if you make it to the high court. And so give me a sense of why we should feel not just good, 
but proud that the buck is going to get to stop with you on what we should do. Well, I thank you for that question. Um, and uh, let me approach it this way. Um, first and foremost, I will piggyback on your references to your father and your experience working with your father. Uh, I, too, uh, worked with my father. Uh, so on Friday nights, he would clean the uh, offices of uh, a large law firm. Um, of course, he had his custodial job with uh, Coit Tower. That was his day job. Uh, and then he had two others. Um, and sometimes he would take my brother and I uh, with us. And, and I saw firsthand how people who sat high and looked low, uh, dignity was not their calling card. And he also worked at the Greyhound bus station at 7th and Mission. He'd swab out the, the stalls there before uh, it's no longer there. But there were people who lived on the street in and around there. And I saw the, the majesty of their dignity in juxtaposition. So I say that to say that my fundamental grounding um, is with people and understanding people um, in all the ways that humanity manifests. And I will bring that with me to reading the records and deciding the case of the Supreme Court. Two, uh, I've had a broad array of experience as a trial judge. Um, and so understanding what happens in real time in terms of the way the cases develop through the courts of appeal where I've also spent time and deciding both with my colleagues what cases to accept and then valuing their insight and opinion and bringing my skills and experience to bear on how cases get resolved, I think that should also uh, give you confidence. And third, I have had an opportunity to deal with issues of great magnitude, both on the federal bench and on the uh, Court of Appeal here. I've sat with the Supreme Court pro tem. I've actually gotten to review the Supreme, Supreme Court's work on federal habeas across the street. And so I think I have a perspective about cases uh, and controversies of the magnitude that the high court deals with on a regular basis. Uh, and I bring that experience with me. And of course, what I will learn from my colleagues. And those are some of the reasons why I think you can repose confidence uh, in my ability uh, to show the responsibility of the buck stopping with me. I have a question or two more. And as much as uh, I think most of us think of confirmation hearings for judges to be contentious and lots of uh, tension in the air, I, I think a lot of us are struggling to make this a little bit more animated because you just heard my tough question. And so uh, the, the next question I have uh, relates to some of the subjects that I, I suspect you'll get to discuss and then render a ruling on in the future. And I know you can only get into things so much, but whether it's an issue like money bail, criminal justice reform, California is taking the lead in trying to move justice in a direction that approaches and touches more people the way we'd like. And I'm wondering if you can think of a couple of areas where you believe, without telling us where you would land, but where you believe the California Supreme Court will have an opportunity to give the definition of justice a more rounded sense? Well, without drawing a line in the sand, I mean, I think with what has transpired in the last nine months in our country and, and the tumult uh, over issues of racism and, um, and uh, uh, issues that relate to sort of a, a view from a caste system perspective uh, that certain people are treated in certain ways, I mean, I think the Supreme Court now is dealing with and will be dealing with um, issues that relate to uh, Batson and Wheeler error. Um, that's an area that I think that the Supreme Court is continuing to try to give guidance to. And there is a new statute that has just been passed. And 
that statute perhaps will be tested at the level of the high court. Uh, so that, that is certainly uh, one area in the criminal justice uh, side of things. Um, on the other hand, uh, we saw a lot in this election about uh, issues of climate control and the environment. And we have a very robust uh, statute here, uh, CEQA statute, uh, that there are many, many issues uh, that remain yet to be resolved with respect uh, to various uh, statutory requirements and, and even some of the definitional language of that statute. And so I think that's another area uh, where the Supreme Court's guidance uh, and of course, it's even broader than that, but it's necessary. And so those are just two of the areas without uh, telling you how I would decide a case of controversy in that regard. Yeah, and my final question is the easiest of all, and I have to ask it because Chief uh, Judge Henderson raised it, and um, I I'm waiting for you to declare, I feel good at some point. <laughs> 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 I suspect it'll come after the vote, but I, 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 tell you, I can't get that out, out of my mind because the judge planted that in my head. It, it just, the, the image was just perfect because if what indeed you're going to be the hardest working uh, justice on the court, uh, you've got to feel good. And so, I don't know if you need to answer that one, but I just, uh, I, I, uh, I say to you with a great deal of pride that there are a lot of people look to you as that mentor and, and are hoping so, for some really big things on this court. So thank you. Justice Jenkins, I'm sure you feel good. <laughs> I'm just going to say one word of wisdom which, uh, with my colleagues on the Supreme Court and video lives forever. <laughs> so if you think about that, we'll enable it. Uh, let me say I have a question and I, I say it because every member of the California Supreme Court is here either in person or in spirit. We also have the governor's office. We also have members of the Court of Appeal. We have dedicated attorneys. We have luminaries from the bar. And your witnesses have spoken. Mr. Singh has spoken. And I've heard your moving stories about your father's work and you working side by side. And I've heard you talk about this where you haven't, as the Reverend has said, left not a dry eye in the house. And I ask you this because I get from you and I know from you that you have an innate sense of justice about you. And it comes from not only your parents and your brothers and sisters and your aunts and uncles, but your life that you've lived. And I know that when you left the Court of Appeal and you went to work for Governor Newsom as Judicial Appointment Secretary, it seems to me that that was not a decision that you made lightly, that you left a bench to go work and to help the governor in justice and to reach justice in a different way. I mean, to hear, of course, your storied resume at the state and federal levels, of course you administer justice. But when you went to work for Governor Newsom, you worked justice in a different way. And in that way, you brought forth the names and faces of people for consideration of, for our governor for an appointment. And through that, this governor has made tremendous choices and further enriched our judiciary, further enriched our diversity, further enriched our lens. And so you have touched justice in every way in all of the tasks and professions and jobs and responsibilities you have taken. So now I ask you, you've touched justice this way by presenting lawyers to become judges and seeing their lifetime career. And then now you've, you've chosen another responsibility of coming to work at the Supreme Court and sitting with six principled, passionate people to discuss the most important cases in California. So while both are administrations of justice, why the court and not uh, your, your judicial appointments position? That's a very good question, uh, Chief, um, and one that I asked myself uh, at the time the governor uh, apprised me that he wanted to nominate me. Um, he told me at one point he was a little concerned because I took almost four days to get back to him. <laughs> um, and in that four days, I thought long and hard 
uh, about the call to service in this respect, coming back to the court, and the opportunity I've been availed of to work with the governor and Ann O'Leary, who's here, and the 120 lawyers and judges across the state who do the initial vetting of the candidates with the Jenny Commission, getting to know and visiting about 25 to 30 counties in real time because courts are organisms unto themselves and they have a chemistry. And you don't want to make an appointment to a court without understanding that. It may not be dispositive, but you want to understand it. And we're two years in. And is my work done here yet? So I took the time to think about that and took the time to ensure myself as much as I can that this wasn't about me. It's not about me elevating myself to some lofty perch. When I netted it out, I felt that I could do good work, quality work, that I had a voice to add to the discussion that might be absent, not better, just different. And ultimately, being a man of faith, I felt this was a calling. And I have never once, never once refused the call to service. That is evident, Justice Jenkins. Thank you for that answer. I'll now ask the commission. Uh, the com this completes the list of witnesses and our questions. Is the commission prepared to vote? Yes. Yeah. All members in support of Justice Jenkins for the California Supreme Court, please say aye. 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 And we have considered and received the correspondence and the testimony. We find the Honorable Martin J. Jenkins qualified to be an Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court, and we hereby affirm and confirm your appointment. Congratulations, Justice Jenkins. Jenkins, I know that you will be taking the oath at a later date, but I do invite you to the, mo to the podium at the front of the courtroom so you may have the opportunity to greet the well-wishers who are not only in the courtroom but in the overflow room and are watching California-wide on Granicus. Well, thank you, Chief. Um, you better sit. <laughs> it won't be long-winded, but I, I do have a number of people that I, that I need to thank, and I brought notes to make sure that, that I don't. Um, I want to thank the governor first and foremost. Um, governor Newsom is an extraordinary man. Um, I did not know him well when I took this position. And the esteem in which I hold him has only grown over the last two years as I watched him deal with difficult issue, fires, a pandemic, the potential bankruptcy of uh, the major provider of electricity uh, in this state. And to do so with a kind of diligence and intellect and heart and soul that he brings to bear on every decision he makes. What a gift to get to spend the last chapter, at least what I thought, working for a man like that. Ann O'Leary is here today, and I know this would not have happened without Ann O'Leary. Ann O'Leary is the governor chief of staff. Um, she is the one who has hired a crack staff that worked with the governor to implement the policies that this state does implement. And so goes California, so goes the country. And Anne has done a tremendous job, and she has been one of my biggest backers. I want to thank the staff in the governor's office because they are family. We are really bonded. I won't mention names because I'll forget one, but uh, to a person, every one of them has contacted me and, and given just such a heartfelt congratulations because we are family. And when you're working on a pandemic, and not so much me, but those individuals for almost three months, seven days a week, I have never seen anything like it. It was inspiring. And the work that they did under those circumstances, simply extraordinary. So I want to thank all of them. 
I want to thank this panel for convening uh, this hearing so expeditiously um, and for not making it too tough on me. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I've been here with you. I've seen all of your work. I have relationships with each one of you that are not personal, but professional. Um, but so goes professional in many respects, so goes the personal. Uh, and you are as good and qualified and extraordinary in your professional life as you are in your personal life. And that is inspiring to me. Um, I also want to thank the Jenny Commission uh, for the work they did. Uh, I've gotten to know the work that Jenny does from the inside out, having been the governor's appointment secretary. And I, too, am amazed and inspired by the volunteerism that goes on with the individuals who do this work. They take it seriously. They take it lethally seriously. They want to get it right. And I appreciate the work that you've done, not just on uh, with respect to my nomination, but the work that you've done over the last two years for the citizens of this great state. They deserve nothing less than your best and you give it all the time. I also want to thank uh, the Chief's Administrative Secretary, Amoy Kim, uh, Jorge Navarrete, who's the Clerk of the Court, um, the Security, the Judicial Protection Unit, uh, make sure that, that wherever the court is, that the court need not worry about its safety because it's taken care of, and all the attendants who ushered people in and out of the building today uh, who do their work uh, with such a plum. Um, I've heard many, many times from God loves adverbs. And the fact is that you all do what you do incredibly well. It would be remiss from, of me not to mention Ming Chen, the departing member of the California Supreme Court. The members of that court know and love him and respect him. I met Ming Chen as a, a very uh, young attorney. I think I was 33, 34 at the time. I was only qualified to sit on one court that was a municipal court because I didn't have 10 years of legal experience. And Ming Chen sort of took up my cause. Uh, we met for a fried chicken dinner at the Merritt Cafe. He explained the process to me of, of how one becomes a judge. Um, and from that day to this, uh, he has been a kind of mentor, uh, continually pulling me across the finish line. And, what an amazing uh, opportunity to fill the position that he vacated and served in with such distinction as Justice Klein talked about for so many years. I want to thank Joe Kachet, who's here, and Nancy Nishimura, who's here. Uh, Joe is uh, uh, many things to many people. Uh, he's a consumer lawyer par excellence, uh, and he's been one of my biggest cheerleaders. I appreciate you so much, Joe and Nancy, for all you've done. The speakers were extraordinary, in some ways hard to listen to, uh, because uh, you know, who can be that good, really? Um, but the fact is, they're that good. They are that good. Um, Adrian Beasley, Reverend Beasley, I met as a young district attorney in the Alameda County office, and um, I watched her try a case. It was through her I got the first glimpse that as an African-American lawyer, not only could I be a good trial lawyer, but I had a perspective to bring that absent my present would not be brought forward. So I thank you, Kitty, for that. Kitty is her nickname we refer to her as. And I say all the time, everyone should have a Kitty Beasley in their life. She speaks truth to power. She holds a mirror up so that you can see yourself clearly, not judgmental, but honest as the day is long. You have been my partner on this journey, and I thank you so much. Know what to say about William McGinnis. Uh, William McGinnis, I met, he may not recall, but he, he interviewed me at USF Law School. That's the first time I remember him. I know he had much to do, along with Justice Corrigan, in my hiring. We have been marching down a road together, the DA's office, Department of Justice. His office was on the fourth floor where the Attorney General's office is. 
Justice Kruger knows uh, that, that area of justice well. And I would go down from the seventh floor where the uh, criminal section civil rights division was for pep talks. The work of the criminal section is difficult. Uh, traveling to places uh, in Mississippi and Georgia and Louisiana. Um, I was a kid from San Francisco and always wondered why people were staring at me as I walked down the main street with two white FBI officers and a black guy in a suit. Um, but they knew who we were. They knew why we were there. And sometimes they would say things that were upsetting, difficult to deal with. And Bill was there on the fourth floor for advice and counsel at all times. And he talked a little bit about the program at the DA's office. I just want to highlight this because Bill had much to do with this. He spearheaded the effort in this. Under D. Lowe Jensen, the Alameda County DA's office was the first DA's office in the country to interview at law schools like the large firms do. And they did it to diversify that office. In the late 70s, it was unheard of. And without that program, I wouldn't be here today. Judge Sondra Armstrong probably wouldn't be on the federal bench. And our newly elected vice president might not be there because she came through that program as well. What a contribution you have made and have made to the judicial branch in terms of your co-chairing the uh, Futures Commission with Justice Corrigan over and over again. You've answered the call of service, and I thank you for being my friend. And last, Delton Henderson. I don't know that I can say anything that hasn't already been said about Delton Henderson. I can say that when I called his chambers way back when and asked for some career advice, I can answer your question. I did do it in part because you had played football. But I also read about your time in the Justice Department and your work with Dr. King. And there was no one, no one that I knew who had had that experience. And so I used the rules of career advice to get to meet you. And what fruit that meeting has borne over all these years. 17 years almost to the day from that initial conversation, I took the chambers right next to you. and became your chambers mate. It would not have happened without you. And what you've done for me, you've done for countless thousands. I always say if we didn't have the symbol of Lady Justice, with the balance scales, and if we wanted another symbol, it would be you then. It would be you. So let me conclude with this. My family is here. Nothing more important to me than my family. My brother sits to the right here. He had a wonderful career with uh, Pacific Bell. We both worked for the same company at one point. And we and my family believe in having numerous chapters of life and experience. And so he left the phone company and became uh, an official and ultimately was selected to officiate in the NFL. Had a 22 year career there, two Super Bowls, a playoff game every year after he was eligible to have it. He was an extraordinarily good official. The only blemish is the 49ers lost a championship game in New Orleans to the Baltimore Ravens <laughs> because my brother didn't have the courage to make a call. <laughs> now, he would tell you that he was an umpire. He was supposed to watch the offensive lineman, whether it was home, holding or not, and that was the back judge who was some 15 yards down the field. Nonsense. <laughs> You're a San Franciscan. You're supposed to make the call. You are but he's, he's, he's just been my big brother, and, and uh, he is the most like my father, the most gracious, most kind of any of my father's children. His wife is next to him, Judge Gloria Rines, who just retired, who's sitting on assignment right now, I think in Modesto. And we have been friends since law school, and to her right are the twins, quote, unquote, Harrison and Morgan, who are fabulous, fabulous young people, whip-smart, kind, caring. They get it. 
They're applying for colleges now, and I'm so proud of them. They're going to make a difference. Next to Morgan is my sister, Monica, who is clearly the smartest of the Jenkins children. There's no doubt about that. Um, she's been recruited by the Gates uh, Foundation to work in Seattle, and has been an executive in human resources for Amgen and Genentech and had a wonderful career. But I think if you ask her what her greatest accomplishment is, it would be raising her son, Cameron, my nephew, who's sitting right back here, who is a wonderful young man who has taken a hiatus from school now and finding his way. And like everyone in his family, giving back in his very special way. And last but not least is my partner, Sydney. Thank you for letting me go on for a bit. I see Justice Pollock's here and the justices in Division Three taught me so much about how to be a good judge and I'm glad he's present. Last is Sydney. I tell people all the time, I've gotten to do everything I've wanted to do in life, everything, not when I wanted to, but in God's time, I've gotten to do it. And the one thing that eluded me was a relationship, in part because of the struggle I had with accepting who I was. And I had so many friends who have wonderful, wonderful, loving, caring, supportive relationships. And there's a period of time where I said to myself, well, I've been blessed abundantly. That's just not going to happen for me. And then Sydney showed up. And he is kind, and he is loving, and he is supportive. He provides my life with a level of balance and comfort. And now I understand what people who are in loving, caring relationships really have. I've experienced it, and thank you, Sid. So that's it. I promise to work as hard as I possibly can to be deserving of the trust reposed in my ability to serve in this tremendously high office, and I thank you all for coming to me. Can you let him know if he needs to? Okay. We stand in recess. Now is the time to party. Woo!